Games with Names is presented by WinBet. Bet with the best this football season. Join the WinBet team today. January 30th, 2000. The Georgia Dome, Atlanta, Georgia. Six seconds left on the clock. The ball on the 10-yard line. The Tennessee Titans trail the St. Louis Rams 23-16. McNair to Dyson. As the clock hits zero, he reaches for the goal line. This is The Longest Yard. I'm going to do a different voice every time. (laughs) (laughs) Just do a British accent. Hello, welcome to Games with Names presented by WinBet. I'm Sam Morell. And I'm Julian Edelman. And we're on the search to find the greatest games of all time. Today's episode, The Longest Yard. Super Bowl XXXIV. What is that, Jack? Super Bowl, what is that? That is 34. Super Bowl 34, the St. Louis Rams versus the Tennessee Titans. I did not go to fourth grade and learn my nomen numeral root, whatever. <laughs> and our guest. <laughs> we got Kurt Warner, man. We got, we got, we got Kurt. I'm Kurt pumped. Warner. I'm so excited. You Disney wanna... movie, Kurt Warner. Is it a Disney movie? I don't know. It looked like it was produced by Kurt Cameron. It was. But it had like Christian vibes. He's a, he's a religious hero. He's a God guy, and there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. He, no. It's an incredible story uh, after watching that movie and then watching- I haven't the, seen it. I heard it's great. It's a very good movie. I mean, it, it's one of those feel-good movies where, like, if you're down in the dumps, maybe yeah. had a crazy weekend, you have the Sunday scaries, you're lying in bed, you throw that movie on, I tell you right now, you're going to feel good. Yeah, I want to. Who does want to feel good? Either or, that movie or opiates. <laughs> That's the that's the recipe right there. First thoughts on the game. I mean, this game has got it all. It's big names. It's a crazy finale. There's huge plays. I mean, Kurt Warner. I haven't watched this game in a long time. Kurt Warner, Isaac Bruce, Marshall Falk, Tory Holt, and then on the other side you got you know Eddie George, Steve McNair, Kevin Dyson, Javon, Javon Curse. Curse. Yeah. It, it, it had like just like you said a whole bunch of everything you you saw some defensive great defensive stands in that first half the second half is start when the the fireworks started coming you saw special teams you saw that were terrible the the block kick the flub snap you saw field goals that were made field goals that were missed you saw big explosion plays this is going to be an exciting game to break down with Kurt Warner with his inside thoughts on everything this was such an iconic game that I remember it being referenced in the end of Castaway. Was it? Yeah, remember? Do you guys remember that? Yeah. At the end of Castaway, Tom Hanks comes back and Helen Hunt is like, we got a football team now, you know? <laughs> lost, just barely lost, too. And he's like, cool, I was on an island for 10 years, so can we talk about that? She's trying that- to talk about football? That's how good a game it was. She tried to bring up football. After he was on an island with a freaking volleyball for four years. But she years. was she was a little, I mean, she was confused because she thought he was dead. She went on, married on, had the kids with someone else, but she still loved him. So she yeah. didn't know what to bring up. So she thought to bring up football because maybe it was one of his, you know, his his loves of his life. life. I guess football is better than us. So I've been seeing this other guy's dong. <laughs> That's better than that. But it's still weird. You're like, we used to be married and in love. And now she's with this dude. Wilson. Classic movie. I love that movie. You, it's one of those movies you can't turn. I know. I, you know what I mean. It's. It doesn't even speak in like the first forty five minutes. But let's let's go back to January thirtieth, two thousand. How old were you, Sam? I was fourteen. How about you? Eighty six. I was like fourteen. I think. Yeah, we're the same age. Same age. Yeah. Same age. I think yeah. I was fourteen. Crazy. Number one movie in America. Eye of the Beholder. Oh, it was a turd. I saw it. I saw it in hopes of seeing Ashley Judd uh, full frontal. And I'll be honest, there was a deal you made in the 90s, early 2000s. If Ashley Judd was in a stinker, you hoped to see Full Frontal. And this movie did not deliver. Shame on you, Eye of the Beholder. Uh, a 9% on Rotten Tomatoes. 9%? Well, Terrible. How about next Friday? That was, it was solid. John Witherspoon's a legend. I, I loved him. I loved him. Yeah. I loved those Friday movies. Ice Cube, going into the suburbs, had to get out. I mean... What was the little cholo dudes? Remember what that they called them? Yeah. The little cholo dudes that were like punking them left and right. I mean, I like Mike I used, Epps. Mike it, Epps. It was just tough because like 
as funny as Mike Epps was, we miss Chris Tucker. That was the worst thing about that movie. Yeah. Chris Tucker single-handedly was probably the best thing on regular Friday, the, the first Friday. I mean, he, Chris Smokey? Hulk, Chris Tucker. Hey, Smokey, you taking a shit? <laughs> I don't know if we're allowed to do that voice. I don't know if we're, as white men, allowed to do that voice. We'll cut that out. No, keep it. Hey, Jules, so in the Super Bowl against um, the Rams that you played, I sat next to Mike Epps. Whoa. Fun fact. Fun fact. Oh, Kyler, one of our producers slash directors sat by Mike Epps in the Super Bowl against the Rams. Cheap seats, though. The Rams. Wow. Ooh. Yeah, Mike Epps, big comic. Playing Richard Pryor in uh in winning time right now. Is he? By the way, yeah, yeah. I gotta check I, I I watched a couple episodes it's of that. Fun. I think it's fun. I enjoy it. It's fun. It's some ridiculous trends. The boy bands like In Sync would dress in all white and uh right bangers. In sync, man. In sync. I remember that. Backstreet Boys. 98 Degrees. I mean, don't act like you didn't listen to them. Yeah, we all listened. Yeah, you, you never could tell your boys you listened to them, but yeah. you knew the songs. Oh, I know every word. I hate it. I. It's one of those things that you're annoyed that you know. It's like I forget people close to me's names, then I know Backstreet's back, all right? It, what the hell? It's an easy lyric. It's, it's, it's an easy it's lyric. Easy. The Nokia. Classic. Dude, I used to play Snake on that thing in like eighth grade, trying there. And my like that was before teachers knew you had cell phones. I would I would snag my mom's phone every once in a while. Take a look at that picture. Those were awesome. Remember you had to hit the two, four, eight, and the six for to go left, right, up, and down? Texting was brutal on that thing. But texting wasn't a big thing yet, so it was fine. Did you have a pager? I never had a pager, did you? I had a pager. Yeah? Yeah. I had to have a pager. I thought it was like cool to have a pager. Pager's so weird because you're either like a dealer. Or a doctor. Those were the two people who had the pagers. Nah. Or you're either, you're either coming to surgery or coming with a dime bag. Do you remember the pager talk? The one, four, three, I love you to like your chick or your girlfriend? I remember the talk. Or like, yeah. uh, what was it? Nine, one. Or if your mom needed you, nine, one, one. She's like, get home. <laughs> there was like a whole bunch of other things you could put in. I forgot about it. Napster. That was huge. I mean, the Napster set the the path for Kazaa, LimeWire, all that share. shit. Yeah, dude. I I mean, Napster was huge. Yeah, that was revolutionary. It literally changed the music industry. Yeah, they had to start touring. You couldn't just chill at home and no. hope for. Uh, <laughs> if you if you were a musician, you're like, I have to go on the road now. I have to. I have Tony to Bennett's be like, I'm 97. I have to start showing up to concerts now. <laughs> this is bullshit. He's still doing it too, and he's still yeah. doing it well. Survivor premiered. I used to watch that with my folks. It was like a family thing. The tribe is spoken, thing out. Never I mean, saw it. You never saw it? Never watched one episode of Survivor. I was, I, I was, a, what was this? Richard? Richard was the first winner. He was always naked, right? He was always naked. Yeah. Very, very strategic on how he, how he got that win. Pre well, that's, as an athlete, you must appreciate it. Nah. You're a competitor, though. Yeah. I mean, I would always watch like the the challenges, like to if you got the immunity. Remember, you used to get immunity if you won the challenge. Nah, I was like, seen it. so they would like stand on a pole, and the, the person who could stand on the pole the longest, like I would think to myself, like, I could easily, I could, I could win that. I could win that. And then if you got immunity, then you yeah. couldn't get voted off. So. Ooh. That was like the thing. So if you won the, a certain challenge, you they couldn't vote you off. Interesting. And then you could give immunity to other people. There was like a lot of politics into it. I learned a lot of negotiation and and uh, friend skills from Survivor, I think. It was also Y2K. I mean, that was, people were saying it was going to be the end of the world. Remember that? I remember going to Lucky's. We have Lucky's out in the Bay Area. Like on December, last week of December with my mom. She's going grocery shopping. And there was nothing on the shelves. People thought because- wow. Y2K was coming. The world was going to end. The banks couldn't calculate a zero at the end or a two at the beginning. Everyone's money's going to be gone. That was a shit show. That was a shit. And it was, it was just a year. It's just time. But there were these people who were like, it says this in the Bible somewhere. And we're like, all right, I mean, I'm stupid. I'll play along, I guess. But uh, J-Lo, that was another. J-Lo. The green dress. Oh, the green dress was great. That was that was right. See through, see through, right? and the boobs hanging out was pretty cool. See through, AOL. What was your screen name? SM you Swinger. SM Swinger. Yeah, I was XXX Edelman. One. We X, both sound X, like X. we both sound like pervs. 
What I, the hell is with our name? My SM Swinger it was my name because it was uh, the movie Swingers. But my mom was like, that's not what Swinger means. In yeah. the movie, you find out it's because of the restaurant. But like, I was a kid. I was like, Swinger. I'm a Swinger. I like Triple X because it was like a dirt bike thing. There's like <laughs> dirt bikers like XXX. I don't know. It was weird. But I was like, we were 14. I didn't. I didn't. I don't really. Think XXX that. is such a hilarious name for a 14 year old. Yeah. I'm into biking, mom. <laughs> <laughs> I like biking. It's like it's super so bad. My name is XXX plays with self uh, at AOL.com. Remember? Because I play by myself on bikes. In sports world, January 2000, Mark Cuban bought the Mavericks from Ross Perot Jr. Wow. For $285 million. Did I pronounce that right? Perot? Yeah, yeah, you nailed it. That you know what? That's that's French, I think. <laughs> I think that's French. Perot. I have to say about the J Lo thing real quick, because you're a Boston guy, and I do feel the fact that she took Ben Affleck from A Rod is an attack on New York from Boston. I do feel like a little it to me it almost feels like if KG, like his woman just started sleeping with Woody Allen or something. Yeah. You would I, take that personally as a city. I mean, you should, but like, you know, Boston's a comfortable spot. She knew Boston before she knew New York. They're hitting cheers. You know, the they're hitting cheers. <laughs> they're going out, having a nice night on the commons. Yeah. They might go over the seaport, go to Strega, grab some Italian. I mean, Boston's got good food. I got to give it to you. Not like I, I tell some you, of the right, best seafood, some really good seafood. But I mean, New York's got insane food. This New place York's, is I love it here. Let's get into the teams. All right, well, the Tennessee Titans, they were 13-3, and three, coached by Jeff Fisher and his awesome uh, old-school mullet. They say he was a rock star. Was I heard he? stories about him going out, like, because he, Nashville, this is in Nashville, he was like a country-singing rock star, Whoa. always at the country song, like concerts, like hanging out with the guys. Like, he was a fun coach, I heard, players yeah. coach. Undefeated at home. Some of their offense, I mean, you know these names, Steve McNair, Eddie George, Derek Mason, Aaron Kevin Aaron. Dyson, Frank Wycheck. Wycheck. Remember that dude? He was a beast. The miracle in the Music City Miracle. Was it a forward pass? Was it not? Wycheck threw it. Hmm. Defense, Javon Curse, who we mentioned, Blaine Bishop, Samari Roll. I mean, this was a stacked team. Stacked. And then you've got to take a look at the 1999 St. Louis Rams, the greatest show on turf. Dick Vermeil, everyone knew him at the Eagles. That's where he got his start. Got his second time around here in St. Louis. Offensive coordinator Mike Martz. Everyone knew about the Martz system with that. What is it? We'll ask um, Kurt Moore with that West Coast that they were doing from Bill Walsh. It's the team's first playoff appearance. In St. Louis, used to be the L.A. Rams back in the early 90s. And now they're back. Now they're back. Crazy for all you people that didn't understand that, but that's what really went down. Notable losses. Titans, week eight, lost to the Titans. Got a little scout tape on them. That's always the best when you play a team that you you play again in the, in the, in the playoffs or you, you match up again because you have that tape. You got that feel. Of, of going against that player, against their scheme, how they kind of, the flow of the game, that's always big. It's got to be hard to beat a really good team twice, twice. in a row. Too. Very hard. Yeah. Very different than other sports, you know what I mean? It's it's just, there's so much preparation in football and then the tendencies. I mean, there's these guys are crazy, Coach. Every regular season win was by more than one possession. That's why they were the greatest show on turf. Kurt Warner won the MVP. Jack, this was the year that he took it over from Trent Green? That's right. Trent Green went down in the preseason uh, against the San Diego Chargers. San Diego Chargers. Who hit him? Did Rodney some- Harrison. Oh. Rodney Harrison, one of the toughest football players I've ever met, watched, and learned from. Didn't get to play with him, but we we saw a lot of tape with him. Uh, on the offense, I mean, it, th- this is just – these are some names. Marshall Falk, Torrey Holt, Isaac Bruce played with Torrey Holt. Side note, uh, he retired as a Patriot. Ricky Prohl, one of the founding fathers of the white guys uh, uh, at receiver, <laughs> him and uh, Wayne Corbett. He, he was, was their third receiver. He was their he was, third receiver. And he was a really good receiver. Really good receiver. Yeah. Orlando Pace on defense. You had London Fletcher. Crazy stat about him. I don't think he missed a snap in his whole career. Wow. Only made one Pro Bowl. Was always at the top of the leaderboard at tackles. 
small te- uh, small school guy didn't he, he miss was a, a dude, snap. He was a dude in video games. You were like, I'm controlling this dude. A 100%. Yeah. He didn't miss a snap at linebacker. Yeah. Dre Bly, Grant uh, Wistorm. Grant Wistorm. Yeah. Kurt Warner, though, he did lead the NFL in red zone interceptions with five. We're going to have to ask him about that. That's like a cardinal sin for a quarterback. If you're in the red And he area, played for the Cardinals, too. And, and he played for the Cardinals, took yeah. him to the Super Bowl with yeah. Larry Fitzgerald. That was a, that was a tough Steelers. Yeah. Tough. We might have to talk about that one yeah. in another future episode over here with Games With Names presented by WinBet. Now let's get to the game. Great uniforms. Great uniform game. This is, both of those uniforms are badass, especially the Ram helmets are pretty dope. I love the Ram helmets. Yeah. I like this generation Ram. And now that did they go, they went to powder for a second, right? And now they're back to this. The yellow and blue is just, that's the Rams. I like, I actually like the older Rams. I like the Navy and white Rams. Really? Like the seventies Rams. My dad was a, a Rams fan when I was a kid and he always talked about it. Like their uniforms and, who was that? Uh, the defensive end. Um, they had a really crazy defense. We should pro- Jack Youngblood. Jack Youngblood. Exact. I mean, we get. That's why we got Jack. That's why we got Jack. Your machine, Jack. This is a rematch. Obviously, we said of the regular season game, the Titans won twenty-four to twenty-one. You think about Steve McNair, you know, obviously he's no longer with us, but it's like terrible. you rewatch this and you're like, man, this is one of the coolest players ever. Like he, love Steve McNair. Air McNair. Fan. Yeah. I mean, he was so elusive and like the big playability he had, he'd always stick it on his guys. He had guys hanging off him. I mean, that last play on the last drive or the, the, the play to set him up to have the longest yard. I mean, he made three guys miss. He, He's retreating. If they win, that's the that's the play. He's MVP. Yeah. He's MVP if they win. And he was incredible in the second half, as was Eddie George. I mean, there's so many big names in this. Also big performances. I mean, this is... Uh, How cool was it to see the, the bob and weave in the end zone by the, the Rams after they scored? They spun it. They always before they the, outlawed it, right? They outlawed it the next year. Yeah. I mean, no fun league sometimes. But they're getting back to fun. We're getting back to fun here. Gotta have the here. dancing. Come on. We want the dancing. I mean, nowadays, you, you see people like rowing boats. You see people jumping in, uh, you know... Uh, what is it? The big bucket thing. Uh, you get in trouble when you throw it into the crowd still, though. You get fined for that. How much is that? I... Uh, Seventy five hundred when they I they got did you it. once they yeah. got me on it in, in seventy five hundred dollars for yeah, that so why why is it so much how much does the football cost well, eighty tech, bucks you know according to the rule of law it could create a riot mm. for people That's trying how the L A riot started someone threw a football <laughs> <laughs> what so seventy five hundred seventy five hundred I tried to go you know they reduced it. Um, my agent, Steve Dubin, had a, a very compelling argument that, you know, after I scored a record setting punt return action, I saw a uh, it was I believe it was um, it was like military day. Yeah. We were wearing all the, the camo stuff. We saw a guy in, that was in the military, I believe a Navy man uh, up in the crowd. And we were trying to throw it to him in honor to, uh, you know, support, you know, the military, big military guy, of course. And uh, we got it reduced to thirty five hundred. So wow, hey, that's pretty well, good. I mean, kudos it's crazy, to old Dave. It's crazy. They I mean, still made Steve. you pay thirty five hundred though. Thirty five hundred. That's I, a lot of money for trying to honor our 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 troops. What do we got, Jack? Looking like the NFL rule book has seven thousand two hundred ten for a first offense, twelve thousand three hundred sixty for a second offense. Yeah, you can't. You don't want to do it. They they get you hard on the second offense. Damn. I was a first time offender at throwing the ball in the end zone. So you know. Was it worth it though? Did it feel good? So good. It was. It was fun. <laughs> it was fun, and, and it's gotta be cool for some. I re, didn't you as a kid like dream of someone like throwing a ball to you or yes. like a pair of gloves or like a towel? Like that was one of the things I'd always oh do God. after a game. I would have taken a jizz rag. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Come on, Patrick Ewing. I'm right here. I would have taken anything. Well. <laughs> Jizz rags. From jizz rags to uh, <laughs> things we may have forgotten. <laughs> Tennessee's third season after leaving Houston. They used to be the Houston Oilers. Yeah. True. Eddie George was on that team. He was. Yeah. He was. That was crazy. I loved the Oilers uh, uniforms. 
that like it was that Oilers is a cool name. I mean, it's very. They were Houston, Texas. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty cool. They yeah. had a cool like. Uh, they had a cool like logo and and the color coordination. What was it? It was it was very mu- it was pretty much the Titans. Titans is a good name too. I mean, it's cool when the when the city when the name fits the city. Like when you hear, uh, you know, Utah Jazz, you're like, all right, guys, come on, this is this should be the be the uh, you know just be the Book of Mormon or something. Be something where we're like everyone in Utah is like, hello, how are you? I'm Brother Gary. Like that's the vibe. It's not the boop 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 boop. boop you know, it's not. <laughs> come on. Can you boop boop boop? I can't. You that was, it. It was I terrible. thought it was pretty good. Thank what about you. the Lakers? There's no lakes in LA. I know terrible. they came from they came from Minnesota, but like I, I still but the Lakers sounds cool still for some reason. Yeah, it's, and it's LA Lakers. Lakers, yeah. You get the alliteration. It's like yeah. a cool Laker, and it's just the the logo's iconic. It is. It is. But you're right. It doesn't make I guess jazz has become kind of iconic in Utah too, but like Yeah. What else is another one? That doesn't make sense. The Washington yeah. Commanders. Yeah, I w- I like the football team. The football team was cool. I thought it was cool. It, Commanders like, just sounds like you you needed something. And you're like hey, Commanders. It sounds like an any given Sunday team name. I don't love Guardians either. The Guardi, ex- yeah, I don't it just get that. sounds kind of. But I like- think they have a thing because on the river of Cleveland was the Cuyahoga River. There's like the Guardian things that were given over. But I don't it just know. doesn't sound. I don't know. I'm not a. F- don't fact check me. Cleveland Commander sounds better, actually. The Cle- they should just named them the Cleveland Brown baseball team. Yeah, the baseball team. I don't know. Uh, the Rams defense was actually very good. Fewest rushing yards and fewest rushing touchdowns allowed. Crazy that they were this good on defense. You want to know why, I mean, though? On offense and- oh, because the offense was that good. The offense yeah. was that good. When you put so many points up, you're, you're, you're making a team one-dimensional that where they have to throw the ball. So that could have been a huge part of it. Yeah. As a football guy. That's that that makes sense. A lot of special team miscues in this game. Three missed field goals in the first half. One flub snap, two misses. And then you had a block you had a block kick in the in the second half. Yeah. I mean, I bet you that uh Del Greco. So Del Greco's the Titans kicker. And I I'm just gonna bring out a story. Scotty O'Brien, special teams guru. In the National Football League, I played under him for like six, seven years. He's, he helped draft me. They used to have this approach to the kick when they were doing like onside kicks, and they would call it the Del Greco because he would widen. Uh, this is terrible. This is a podcast, so I'm, I'm like using my hands. And no, I, no, you people can, watch it too. Pe- yeah, people will watch it, but they would widen out and like he would do like an, a, a certain approach, and that was known as the Del Greco approach. If mm. they were wi- uh, tight, It'd be just an art kick. If they were wide, you had to be sure for the Del Greco approach where they could give you a little sky kick over the other side, try to be sneaky with you. So shout out to old Del Greco who Del missed Greco. a field goal in this game. But hey, you have something named after you, and this is a naming podcast. Pretty cool. Should we do our prop bet? The Gaming Corner presented by WinBet. So the relevant betting lines for this game, uh, the spread, Rams minus seven. Push. push. Yeah. Over under 45. Under. Shockingly. Shockingly under. With the greatest show on turf and a really good miracle in Tennessee football team. That was very, very crazy not to see that over go. But it's Super Bowl. Anything happens. We all know that. Playoffs a little more physical. These teams knew each other a little bit. Refs aren't going to call as much. They're going to let the boys play. Yeah. So for the prop bet, if you're new to the show, every week we do a little bet to see what we can get out of the players, out of us. What can we do? I, I think for the over-under, how many times has uh, Kurt Warner seen Coach Dick Vermeil famous for crying? Famous crier. How many times has he seen him cry? What do you th- What's the number we got to hit? I think three and a half because he probably cried. He probably cried. He cried after this game. For we sure. You know that. Yeah. He probably cried after like Kurt got MVP because Kurt's story was so good. And he's mm. like, a, you could tell he's a loving type guy. Yeah. And then maybe, maybe like. He cried during like a Dawson's Creek episode. He, I heard he's Late a Late 90s. Maybe, maybe he was into that. What was know. that song? I don't want to wait for this time to be something. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think three and a half. Is that is that it? We got it. Yeah, I I I think it's three. I'm taking the under on this. You're taking the under. Is that crazy? I'm gonna take the over. All right. I'm gonna take the over. I feel like uh, 
Coach Ramil being a very players coach type of guy who's cried a few times in the locker room after seeing he had to cut someone or if he had to do wow you know that, that's that's a cryable well, offense. This is the insider picks. So I Jordan's... don't know. Hey, there's no insider information here. There's no inf insider information here. Well, we're gonna hear from Kurt Warner, but before let's do a quick break. Let's take a moment to talk about WinBet. The latest and greatest sports betting app on the market. I, I downloaded it 10 times, I believe. The same five-star hotel service providing an elite sport book in a digital casino app. Get exclusive rewards right at your fingertips. WinBet is fully integrated with Win Rewards. That means if you're playing WinBet, you can score points to earn free credit, free credit. in the app. Free credit? Comp dollars. Comp dollars. That sounds like free money. Towards perks at the Wynn Resorts, you know, get a massage, legitimate. Uh, stuff like discounted hotel stays, priority dining and entertainment. You see Tony Bennett. He's probably only got a few years left. Frank Sinatra, if he was alive. They may have like a, one of those <laughs> digital ones or what is it, like a uh, like, hologram? Yeah, the hologram. Tupac thing. Uh, yeah, even Frank Sinatra Jr. is not they alive. Do, they do anything in, in Vegas. That's true. Nancy, she's like pushing 90 probably. Well, you get discounted hotel stays, priority dining and entertainment, free merch. Sounds like a win to me. And I get to bet on my favorite teams. Pats, Bucks. Nah. No, nah. holy crap. Whoa. Whoa, I just, I brain farted right there. It really is the finest loyalty program in the industry, guys. Use your promo code XGWN and get $100 after placing your first bet of $100. Download the WinBet app now or visit WYNNBet.com to start winning. Terms and conditions at www.winbet.com. Must be 21 or older to participate. And we're joined here, Sam. Big treat, huge treat, such a big treat. They they make movies after guys like this, big, literally with movies the, with the dude from Shazam. With the dude from Shazam, <laughs> yeah. We are joined by Kurt Warner, NFL legend, extraordinary, inspirational story that he went through. We're gonna get to break down the longest yard Super Bowl. 34 i mean that that game is crazy that team the greatest show on turf he's he's the engine i mean he's the, the quarterback Let, let's of it. let's let's just rattle off some of these things yeah so trent green starting quarterback at the beginning of the year everyone's heard about the blood so brady thing this is even crazier if you really think about it trent green goes down gets hit by rodney harrison was it Rodney? Right. Was Rodney. Rockin' Rodney. Hits him, knocks him out, gives Kurt Warner his opportunity. What's he do? He goes on, wins MVP that year, leads a team to a Super Bowl as pretty much kind of a rookie. He, he spent a lot of time in Arizona or in the arena leagues. 28-year-old rookie, though, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. In yes. this league, but he played a lot of football. He he went over, you went across to Europe, right? You went you went to Europe for yeah, a while. I was over in until Europe for a year as well. Yeah. Like just a yeah. just, What do they call it? Do they call it football and what do they call it in Europe? Uh well, I mean because it was part of the NFL. So it was NFL Europe. So we did call it football over there, although you're right. I mean, every time we mentioned football, they were thinking something completely different. But so it was mostly American football is what the term would be for, for what we were doing. American football, there it is. But let's get back th to this. Four-time Pro Bowler, two-time first-team All-Pro, led two different teams to the Super Bowl. I mean, it, his story, I just watched his movie. I was, I was flying over here, I think, and I turned on his movie. And, like, he's the kind of guy you just root for. Yeah. Because of the adversity he overcame, because of the kind of guy he is like how, how let's, I'm going to go off topic. I have nothing. We'll get back into the game, but I, how true is question? that movie? Well, yeah. I how true want, is that movie? Not only that, I want to know, do you play a role in casting? Do they run the actor by you? Yeah. Okay. First of all, no, no role in casting whatsoever. That I, I left that. If, if there was going to be any influence in our family, the casting, I was leaving that to my wife. Like I, I wasn't going to get involved. I wasn't going to screw that part up. So 
But what if they came to you and they were like, uh, Josh Gad is going to play you? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm not like, yeah, I'm not sure my wife would be thrilled happy with me, <laughs> but like, I like Josh Gad. So yeah, I think yeah. he, could, he, could, he could play the part. But we didn't have a whole lot of say in casting, even though they did run it by us a little bit. Uh, I had a little more say in, in the script because I kind of knew the story that I wanted to tell. It was about really about nine, 10 years in the making to get the movie made. Uh, and a big part of it was just the script wasn't what I wanted it to be. It was the story that we wanted to tell. So I had more hand in that part of it. But to your point, Julian, uh, the movie is is very accurate. Now, there's always a little bit of Hollywood. There's a little bit of creativity there. But every story, every scene that you've seen in the, see in the movie was based off of real life, based off of something that happened. So that there wasn't any scene in there where you go, oh, that was made up. So, like, I'll just give you an example. In the movie, when I have my first arena practice, we're out in that, you know, that cornfield, uh, you know, playing with the, the bales of hay uh, as the as the sidelines or as the as the walls. Now, when it was my first practice, we were actually in a park, but they did have bales of hay up as as you know the, the walls. They took two big giant telephone poles and stuck them in the ground as our goalposts. So. You know, they dramatize it a little bit as they put it in a, in a cow pasture. But the essence of the story and, and what it was like when I first walked up to that park going, seriously, like, you know, if, if I throw a ball a little bit wide, I got a guy you know, going over the top of the hay bale. Like, what are we doing here? Like, how did I get here? But, uh, you know, so there's a little bit of Hollywood in there, but it's all based on one real life. Well, I, I just want to let you know, I think you're better looking than who they casted, though, Kurt. It, awesome. See, how yeah. often do you get to say that? Now, I'm not sure it's true, but I, but I appreciate good, you saying dude. that. I appreciate you, you saying that. <laughs> yeah. No, so it goes from bagging groceries to the AFL. To his own movie. To his own movie. Super Bowl MVP. I yeah. mean, it's, it's unreal. Now, going into this game, how crazy different. This is your first time. I mean, he's a fuck. It, he was a rookie. And to be able to have to deal with all the distractions. There's so many distractions going into a Super Bowl especially as a first-time player in the league. Guy gets hurt who's stud. Yeah, then he, Trent Green like, was a killer. I mean, but you're, are, are you like kind of like, I'm ready, dude. This offense is insane. Do you just feel like some, like someone just handed you the keys yeah. to the sickest car ever, and you're like, enjoy? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, Julian, so much of this game is about finding the right fit for what you do as a player. And so obviously nobody knew anything about me when I took over. But, you know, going back to the idea that I played arena football, the beautiful thing about arena football is we never handed the football off. Like, we threw it every snap. We were expected to score every time we had the ball. Uh, you know, we score 70-plus points a game. So when I got to St. Louis and I had all these, these weapons around me, I was like, this is how we're supposed to play. You know, we had Marshall in the backfield, but we rather throw it to Marshall than hand it to him in most situations. And – you know, I remember, you know, we'd be scoring 35, 40 points a game and people would be like, hey, you guys are unbelievable. And I remember thinking, what are you talking about? We're punting twice a game. Like, we got to figure out this problem here because we're not supposed to be punting. So my mentality was to score, to throw, to be, you know, to, to do what I was doing in the arena football. And like you said, the beautiful thing was I had a bunch of pieces around me that were so talented that allowed me to do what I had been doing for years. So... You know, as much as you're, you know, you still have to convince yourself you can do it at the highest level, right? We're all confident. We all get done with college and it's like, oh, yeah, we can play in the NFL. But there's always that period where you really do have to convince yourself. Like, I got to be there. In a, okay, yes, I thought I could. I can do it. I felt I was more than ready for the opportunity. The system fit exactly what I did well and, and the aggressive approach that we took. And then, like you said, couple that with – I mean, Hall of Famers at both wide receivers, you know, main wide receiver spots, Hall of Famer in the backfield, Hall of Fame left tackle. I mean, it was like the perfect storm. Defense was uh, freaking know. good. The defense, defense, was good. defense was good. And, and, you know, what we did well, it played to their strengths. But, you know, Julian, I, I often tell people, like, my story was crazy and it took me a while to get there. But if somebody looked you in the eye when you were 12 years old and you were dreaming about playing in the NFL and they said, by the time you're 28 – You'll have won an MVP, won a Super Bowl, and won a Super Bowl MVP. Would you take it? Heck yeah, you'd take it. So it took me a while to get there, but because everything happened in that first year, 
I was kind of catapulted into the position I would have loved to have been anyways at that stage in my career. And I can just kind of hit the ground running and, and go from there. You know, and I, I'm a firm believer because I have a very similar type story. It took me five, four or five years to get my position solidified in the offense. I had to do everything I had to do that. Everything happens for a reason. You know, yeah. like you playing in the AFL that set you up to like, all right, throwing the ball all the time. That's I'm used to this. This is what I do. You know what I mean? Gives you yeah. that self-confidence. Like for me, it was playing in Ohio in college, like yeah. in a cold weather area like I was a California kid I would go out to Ohio <laughs> never been out there and then it kind of like trained me that when yeah. I got to New England like all right this is what I'm used to you know I'm used to this and like you it, your story always has these crazy little things that just end up right. always working for you oh this is an inspiring guest man next time I have diarrhea I'm gonna be like this is gonna inspire <laughs> me to eat better tomorrow so <laughs> it's all about the greater plan so Kurt, you Kurt is, uh, you know, an inspiring player, man. And and this year, you're going up against the Titans, who, like, they're a, they're a sick team. I mean, you're going up against yeah. Aaron McNair. Eddie George was a beast. Curse on defense. Yeah. He's thinking about curse. Yeah. I saw you yeah. take so many, like, in the movie again. I'll go back to the movie. Yeah. Did your college coach always tell you to stay in the pocket? Okay, so that story. So here's, here's part of Hollywood, right, Julian? That actual the Kirk, Kirk drill. Uh, where I had to do that, stay in the pocket, get hit by all my buddies. It actually happened in high school. Okay. So because we didn't really tell my high school story, I started playing quarterback when I was a freshman in high school. Yeah. And I was a wide receiver before that. So I just wanted to get out. I just wanted to run out there in space. I didn't want to get hit. So that drill actually happened through my high school career. They just kind of pushed it into the college atmosphere in the movie because of that. But that drill was real. I hated that drill with a passion. Uh, I didn't want to have any part of it, but, you know, to your point, when things happen for a reason, you know, when I started playing quarterback, that was my greatest weakness. My greatest weakness is I didn't want to stay in the pocket. I wanted to get out of the pocket. I wanted to move. I didn't want to take a hit. And if you ask people to define my career, one of the things that would define my career when it was all said and done was I would stand in the pocket and take a hit and deliver a throw like very few guys in the league. So ironically enough, those kind of things as you're talking about help to define me, help to shape me, and would ultimately be, you know, those things that set me apart when I actually got to where I wanted to be. And and Sam, that's that's very, you know, that's a competitor at the highest level is someone who can actually take in coaching. There's a lot of guys that work hard. There's a lot of guys that go out and run and sprint and they'll sit and do the throws all day and but it's a it's really about figuring out what you have to do, working hard at that. And then when you get results from that, that's that shows you that that's why he's so great, because he's he sat in there took in the pocket. Because, I mean, you watch this game. I mean, that was a physical defense and you sat up in that pocket. Yeah. I saw you get your your, your pick up <laughs> of your teeth a couple yeah. times off the off the ground with the way these guys yeah. were hitting, especially back in those days. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was game. They're, they had a good defense, and so ironically enough, when we're talking about that game against the Titans, um, you know, we were six and zero that season, and actually played the Titans. So very similar to the whole Patriots dynasty starting. You know, we played them in the middle of the year. We beat them. We played the Titans in the middle of the year. The Titans beat us. They gave us our first loss as a team that year. But we were down like, yeah, exactly. We were down like twenty four of three in that game or 24 to nothing in that game and came back and we missed a field goal at the end uh, to tie that game up and then, then whatever happens. To me, there were, there was so much about that game that helped to define who we were, right? That it's easy sometimes to have things going well when you're not playing good team and you're six and oh, but what happens when you get hit in the mouth? You know, what happens when things don't go your way? And the first time with that group, we had to respond. We had to see what we were made of as a football team. And so ultimately all of that stuff, okay, we played them, they beat us, we could play them in the Super Bowl, but we knew what we were capable of. We knew what happened in that game. We knew we had a chance to beat them in the Super Bowl. And you, and you take some of that stuff and you take it with you into the Super Bowl of, okay, this is what it's going to take. This is the type of, type of team that we're face, facing, but they were good, they were aggressive, um, they would hit both offensively and defensively with Eddie George on the offense. 
They were all about punishing you and making you feel it. And on defense, they were going to blitz you and hit you. And uh, they came after me a lot in that game. But it was that fun cat and mouse of them blitzing and, and, and us trying to figure out how to attack the blitz. And uh, great football game. Great bunch football of, game. There was, a bu- there was it a bunch of man blitz. I didn't have a, like a coach cut up. I was watching it off the things because yeah. you guys were running a bunch of crossers. And then it seemed like when they hit the zone, you'd hit that deep out or if they were going into like a quarters coverage or some kind of soft coverage, you were hitting like the bows and the deep outs yeah. and stuff. Is that true? Is that what it was? Yeah, no, th- there was a little of both. But, you know, we like to do a lot of empty stuff. So it was yeah. almost like they had an empty check. Anytime we were going to go five out, they were going to come after me and hit me. Yeah. So it's like, okay, you can complete the ball, but, but we're going to make you feel it. Um, and, and in that game, I mean, I don't know what – in the first half, we threw for almost 300 yards in the first half. Lighten it up. The only, pro- only problem was we couldn't get in the end zone. Red area so offense. Like, we're doing all this fun stuff between the 20s, but none of it mattered because we couldn't get in the end zone. I mean, we could have blown them out early in that game, but, you know, we scored 16 points, I think, at the half – and we just couldn't put the, put them away. And that's ultimately what would lead to, you know, what happens in the second half and, and, and it turned into, you know, just a, just a great football game, especially down in the end. Well, the, in the, in the second half, Aaron McNair turned it on. Eddie George was running all over you guys. I mean, when you, when you make that play to Isaac Bruce, when you, when you. 999. That that's was, it. I mean, it. What, what was going through your head on, on that drive? Well, I mean, you know, here's the thing. I, I don't know. I'm assuming it's the same for you, Julian. I know you played some quarterback, but growing up, like if any, if you dream of, of playing in the NFL, you you play the you know the Super Bowl in your front yard over and over again. You know, whether you're the receiver that's making the play or the running back or the quarterback. And so, you know, every time I would watch, every year I watch Super Bowl, and then me and my brother are going out in the front yard and we're playing the Super Bowl in our front yard. You know, and every time you play it in your front yard. The ball's in your hands with, you know, a few seconds to go and you're down and then you always throw the touchdown pass to win the Super Bowl. So when I get into the Super Bowl and actually we're up 16 nothing, Titans tied at 16-16, you know, Dick Vermeer actually was talking to me on the sideline and he's just like, Kurt, you've played this game a million times. You know, you wanted to have the ball in your hands with two minutes to go and win the Super Bowl. Now go do it. You know, so I played it out in my head. But in your head, like – you throw the pass as the clock's running out, right? In this game, we get the ball with two minutes to go, and it's the first pass I throw. I throw the pass to Isaac, and he runs for a touchdown. And so, you know, kind of in your mind based on what's happened before, you're like, we just won the Super Bowl. And you don't really realize, hold on a second, there's still a minute 50 to go. And there's a great players or great players on the other side that – have an opportunity to win it. You can't just walk away just because you threw that touchdown pass. So it was a great moment because everybody dreams of that moment of making that play in that moment to win the Super Bowl. It was just the only problem is that I had to stand on the sideline for the next minute 50 and watch as Steve McNair and company methodically moved the ball down the field and had a chance to, to steal that victory from it. Now on that play, when you when you hit Bruce on the sideline, it, it seemed like a two man type play. Was it a two man, or did that safety just get over there? It, no, it, it was just it was just a man play. So man, it was single you know, high. Had, single high. We had talked about that all week long because back in the day, Samari Roll and company with the the Titans, they loved to play high shoulder technique, Julian. So we knew that if we were going to throw go routes, go routes that you know that year. And again, it wasn't like now. Like now, the back shoulder is like. I mean, you know, that's something that everybody goes to. Back in that day, back shoulder wasn't really a thing. Um, but we knew they played eye shoulder technique. And so what we worked on all week was if we're going to throw that go route, we're just going to try to set it up there and kind of keep it on my guy's back shoulder. You know, it's not to drive it now, let him turn and catch the back shoulder, but just kind of lay it on his back shoulder because we knew we'd have an advantage there. And so when he called that play, they were showing a, a quarters, a four high look. And but oftentimes they would drop out of that four high lift. And so it worked out just perfectly. Falls 999 on the first play, we just all go, right? Double seam, all go, however you want to say it. Um, and sure enough, safety's rolled uh, on the spot, laid it up to Isaac. The guy that came flying over was the backside safety. Yeah. As he was he trying to fly in the middle. But Isaac, I mean, obviously, great job not only adjusting to the ball and catching it behind yeah. him, but then making that move and, and getting into the end zone. So 
Um, you know, you, you remember all those details when you're in those moments and you're so focused and you're thinking about it all, you know, you're practicing all week long and then, you know, we get all the way 58 minutes in the game and we've never, we didn't even call the play, you know, but you work on that stuff. And then sure enough, in the biggest moment, it plays out exactly like you had talked about it playing out, you know, all, all week long as you're preparing for the game. And then, you know, you got a great play and make it a great play. The crazy thing about that is like, so situationally on two minute with this, a tied game, like we, we had a Rolex situation. We used to call it Rolex where time's almost as important as points because you want to suck it down, suck the clock down as much as you can. Like, so it was almost, they scored so fast. It was like, Oh, we kind of messed up. You know, <laughs> You know exactly. what I mean? Especially in well, a, like yeah. a Super Bowl. I love the idea of a coach well, yelling, you were supposed to suck it down. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, here's the thing. is like in that Super Bowl, Julian, I wasn't thinking about any of that. Like I was thinking about get the ball in the end zone and go yeah, win this right, game. Right, right. But due to that game, I did. I was fortunate to play in two more in my, in my career. Yeah. And in both of them, it played out exactly like you're talking about. We score with a certain amount of time. Boom, Tom Brady comes down. They kick a field goal with no time on the clock. We score with two and a half minutes to go. Big Ben comes down, throws a touchdown pass to San Antonio with 30 seconds to go and you lose. So what you're saying, I didn't really understand it in that moment because I wasn't even thinking about the other side. Like, just get points on the board and we win the Super Bowl. After going through that game, fortunate to win, the next two times – that was the first thing on my mind. When I threw that touchdown to Larry, you know, with the Cardinals against Pittsburgh, and I ran over to the sideline, everybody's like, we just won the Super Bowl. And I'm like, relax, people. There's a whole <laughs> bunch of time and a lot of good players on the other side. So, you know, to your point, I didn't think about that in the moment, no. but I thought about it every moment after that when I was in one of those two-minute situations. Well, because of those situations, I mean, Bill Belichick, I mean, we would go over this stuff – all the time you know if, to start the two minute drill you want it you obviously for us we would always want to get it started get a play that you're comfortable with you're confident in then you always wanted a chunk play which is always 20 or more yard play that keeps things going and then like then you get in there and do that but you can like the coach would never get mad at you if you score i mean that's just of course you know that clock management I, I understand i mean like because then yeah. they have all this time mcnair is just relentless. There's that 16 yard play to Dyson where he almost goes down, but he somehow breaks yeah. free. He's such an elusive runner. Hits Dyson. They run. They make, of course, the final play again to Dyson, where he's yeah. tackled at the one yard line. I mean, what is the vibe on on the yeah. on the sideline? Well, I mean, again, your your vibe is simply just somebody make a play. Make a like, play. You yeah. know, that's that's all you're asking for. Like it's usually in that setting, right? Jules is. Somebody makes that. Somebody make a sack. Make a sack, and all of a sudden they're in. They're in second and long, and you're like, okay, yes, we got this. You know, the ball gets tipped up, and you know, so Sam, as you're talking about, I mean, there was one play where it was like two guys had Stevie there, and it's like this is it. This is going to finish it. He's like ten yards behind the line of scrimmage, and the dude shakes off both of our guys. Got one hand on the ground, and not only does he shake himself out of that. But then he buys time and he hits a 20 yard throw down the field. You know, so you're just kind of like, come on, like, is this possible? And because McNear was running around, you know, we had a couple really good players, like Kevin Carter, um, DeMarco Farr. Those guys pulled themselves out of the game because they were completely exhausted. You know, and you're sitting there going, dudes, like, there's a, there's a minute left in the Super Bowl. Like, you cannot pull yourself. But they were so exhausted because Steve McNear was just, I mean, he was so incredible because he was so strong. He was so elusive. Um, but that's just, that was my mindset. It was like, somebody just step up and make a play. And I always say it's the worst part of our sport and the best part of our sport, right? Like, you play baseball, you get a chance to hit and field. You play basketball, you get to play offense and defense. In our sport, you do your job, and then you've got to count on everybody else to do their job. And it's the hardest thing about it is sitting on the sideline going, okay, come on. Somebody's got to make a play. Somebody's got to make a play. It's like, it's like a, a marriage, play. right? It's like, it, I, yeah. I mow the lawn, you clean the goddamn dishes. <laughs> yeah. But, but then you know, Jules, but then the best part of it is when you go down and score and then, you know, somebody comes down on the other end, Malcolm Butler comes down on the other end and makes that play on the one yard line to finish the game. You're like, there's nothing better than celebrating knowing everybody on your football team 
needed to play to a certain level mm. for you to win a championship. That is the greatest thing about our sport, the greatest thing about team sports. But it's tough standing over there on the sideline because you always believe, well, if I'm in there, I'll make the play. Like, I trust me. But now you've got to trust everybody else to do their thing, and that's the hardest part about it, but also the most rewarding part. It is the ultimate team sport. Like, yes. you really have to rely on other people, and everyone's accountable in this sport. 53 yes. men. Not, not, not just yep. the offense, not just the defense, the special teams guys. I mean, you could lose a game on special teams with a flub, snap, block, pun, anything like that. Yep. Everyone has a role, and everyone has to do their job. That's, I mean, that's said by a professional. And that uh, makes winner. it almost, that, does that make it sweeter? I mean, you're like, we all did something. We all, this is all of us. You know, that's yeah. pretty cool. No, I, it is. I mean, there's, there's no question about it. And I think it helps you to truly appreciate what our game is all about and you know and i think one of the cool things too about that year was as you guys talked about everybody was talking about our offense like we were all about the offense it was all about our weapons it was all about the greatest show and that's all anybody talked about jules you mentioned it we had a really good defense and we had a lot of really good players on our defense that did i mean our defense scored for us a number of times that year you know we got the points you know we set the records but our defense set us up for so many things, but they just never got the credit. So that was another beautiful part about that Super Bowl is those guys needed to make a play. And those guys stepped up, and the reason we won was because they made that tackle. They made that play in the moment. And so I, I think that was pretty special as well because they didn't get nearly the credit they deserved because everybody was looking at us. Is that the greatest offense in the history of the game? Yes. I mean – yeah. No, I mean, I, I think it was. And I say that, you know, because there's obviously been some great offenses. You oh, played on some great offenses. Yeah, I mean, the Denver team, whatever oh, year that was. seven Pats lost the Super Bowl, though, Julian. Thir I know, Sam. He's a Giants fan, but sir. It's, it's a team sport. It's a team sport. Um, but the reason I say that, Jules, is because we did it at a time when you weren't supposed to be able to do that. Like, now, everybody kind of does it. Like, you know, everybody plays a certain – we played the game a different way. Back then, everybody thought, well, you've got to run the football to win. you got to run the football to be successful. And we, you know, through caution to win, I said, no, you don't. Like, if you're good enough, if you've got the players, if you can execute. And so we, we kind of ushered in a new era of football. And what we did consistently for three years, coupled with the players that we had, right? I mean, I, I think that always is a part of it. We had great players – as well as we consistently played well. But over 500 yards, 500 points, three straight years uh, in an era where you just didn't see that sort of stuff. And then again, to usher in what we see as the NFL now, um, I, I still think, you know, I would put that offense up against anybody that's ever played uh, in this era or that era. Like, I believe that offense could step into this era and we would set records in this era. That's how good I think we would. The thing, oh, yeah, they, yeah, they revolutionized yep. the game. They basically, yeah, they had the offense that every offense is now. I mean, yep. this West Coast. I mean, you got a little bit more this run game with like the Kyle Shanahan stuff, but yep. you know, the spread them and shred them. Yeah, that's yep. the greatest oh. show on turf, and it almost came. It, it was almost an advantage because these teams were built to stop the run. It's kind of yeah. like when the old Niners would go out and play in the '80s. When Bill Walsh would have the the fullback catching little diagonals and they're they're getting their run game through short passes, yeah. these teams were built with the old forty six, the old bear defense, yeah. these big ass linebackers, like they yeah. weren't made to cover. Yeah. So it's like extraordinarily like revolutionary yeah. for these coaches that actually implemented this system yeah. to go on, and it I mean it's changed the game, it's changed how yeah. players are, it's changed the yeah. size of players, the speed of players because of that offense. And that West Coast. Now you got defensive linemen that are running four four, that are two hundred and twenty three pounds, two hundred and thirty five pounds when they used to be two sixty. Big old dudes that would plug the middle of that, you know that that field. It's it's changed, and I do believe that they could step into this game right now yeah. and be an elite team. With I mean, I think you'd probably be better because you wouldn't like you sneeze on a quarterback now. Like, like you, yeah, get right. a, you get a, a penalty. Right. I mean, you sneeze on a quarterback. Now you give him COVID. That's what happens. No, you know, uh, 
It's so true. And Marshall was really such a weapon because uh, he could run yeah. the ball, but then he's as good as any receiver. He was unstoppable. Yeah, so he was, you know, he was a problem. He was the key piece, you know, that, that are, you know, we had good players all over and could have been successful, but Marshall was different. And he was unlike anybody else, like you said, that, that played. We could put him anywhere. He was our ultimate pawn. Uh, you know, we could line him up outside. He could run routes like a wide receiver. I mean, it was – and, and Julian, back to your point about the best offense, that I think what also really made us special was the way we played offense. Like, we would have 225 pass plays going into a game. You know, it was, it was our level of execution and timing. Even though we had great players, we played so efficiently and we did so many things efficiently and well and different that that, to me, is, I think, what sets us apart from some of the other teams. Not that there weren't other unbelievable offense that you can make your argument for. It was just, we were just a finely tuned machine. And it was all about timing. And we let it go. And then here comes Isaac just running out of nowhere. And and we just, we had the guys to be able to run a system like that, where it wasn't just, let me throw it up to Isaac and he'll jump over somebody and make a play. You know, it was designed in a certain way that really made that group unique with all the things that we did. Steps and timing, the old West yeah. Coast. And yeah. the fact that they could have 225 plays a week, that tells you how smart their players are to be able to exactly. execute that many plays. So that means everyone's got to work together. And if you have a right. team that's smart, I mean, I've been, that's, you know, that's, that's the reason why yeah. we won a lot. You know, we, we had guys yeah. that could change personnel groups, different, you know, formations, and you yeah. scheme up all this stuff. Like, right. that's an advantage. You know, a lot no of teams doubt. can't do that. A lot of teams have, right. you know, 14. And, and there's different philosophy in how to coach. A lot of guys say, hey, yeah. this is what we do. We do what we do and come beat us. You know, like mm-hmm. it's just there's different yeah. philosophy. That's that's, well, that's we, a testament of smart right. football play. No question. Because, you know, like 225 plays, you can't practice 225 pass plays in a week. Like you don't yeah. get enough reps in practice. So, you know, we would have plays that we would run engaged and we'd throw touchdowns on that we never ran in practice. Wow. Which is to crazy. your point, Jules. Yeah. It would be like we draw it up and we talk about it, and these guys were so smart and were willing to put in the time and go, okay, I'll learn that play even though we didn't run it in practice. Sure enough, defense gives us something. Mike wants to call it, and our job is to go execute it. And so that kind of stuff was so much fun because it's like, how do you, you know, how is somebody going to stop us? Like, we got all these plays, we got all these things to pull from, we got these great players, and then we got smart guys that no matter what we need to do in the moment, we can adjust and make those adjustments and go out and execute it. It was, it was so much fun to be part of that group. That's also, you know, the coaches having a big trust in the players. Cause like yeah, yeah. the reason why you rep all this stuff is like throughout the week is so your coaches can sleep on Saturday before the game. They want to be able to see it. They want to yeah. see it. They want to see the execution or in the walkthrough or in, the, you know, the right. fact that a coach put something in and trusts you to go out and do that. That means there's a there's yeah. a there's a trust between the players and coaches that was obviously yeah. so yeah. special that you guys are That's considered, right. yeah. you know, one of the best. That trust offenses. was we, was we incredible. Got, we got to ask you. Oh, go ahead. Oh, because, the, you know, the next year you play the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Tom is in kind of a similar situation as you're in, do you see yourself in Tom a little bit that season, him stepping in for Drew Bledsoe? Well, I mean, obviously, a, a lot of correlations from the standpoint of you know, nobody really knew who we were. Nobody necessarily expected it. You know, Drew, I think he just signed his $100 million contract or whatever, maybe the first $100 million man. And Trent had just signed his big contract with us when I ended up getting hurt. So I think there, there is definitely a lot of similarities there. Um, you, know, you guys mentioned a little bit earlier – You know, the difference was I had played a lot of football and, you know, I was 28 years old at the time, Um, you know, wasn't just a a second year guy coming out of college to, you know, hitting the scene. But of course, you know, there was there's definitely some similarities to how it played out. And then the fact that it played out, you know, so close together, you know, within two years of each other, kind of the, the same thing happening. And then sure enough, they end up in the Super Bowl and obviously, Tom ends up leading his team to a win in the Super Bowl, uh, you know, a late win in the Super Bowl. So there were so many correlations. And they beat you. It. Or you guys I beat know. them in the regular season. Yep. 
Yep, we beat just them in like, the regular season. Then the yeah. Giants beat us in the regular, or we beat the Giants in the regular season. Then they beat, you know, like it, it just, it's, it's crazy, crazy yeah. how history repeats itself. Well, and no. then I, we got to ask you, you know, Coach Dick Vermeil, known as a crier, how many times have you seen him cry? <laughs> I mean, you, you can't put a number on. Wow. Um, you know, one of my one of my greatest stories was I remember you know, we were in uh, we were in the little training camp, and it was right around the times that they had to make cuts. And you know, we had this guy on our team that was like the fifth string tight end. So like. Everybody knew the guy wasn't making the team. Like, you know, none of the personal, I mean, we're all, but everybody knew he wasn't making the team. And, you know, I remember Dick Vermeil coming into our huddle after he had to release this guy. And so, you know, for most of us, it's probably like, oh, they're releasing him. Good. I got a better shot to make the team. But Dick Vermeil's in the middle of this huddle in training camp and he's crying because he had to release our, our fifth team tight end. And we're like, what, what's going on here? Like, what, what's really, what? it was just kind of a peer inside of who Dick Vermeil was. Like, he wow. was all about his players. He wanted what was best for all the players. He wanted everybody to truly make the team. Like, uh. I know, you know, how much this hurts me that this guy, because I think he's a great guy, will not be able to fulfill his dream. And so there was story after story like that with Dick Vermeil that you just, you know, he's just such a phenomenal individual. And I remember when I was playing for him, I talked to guys that played for him when, when he was a high school coach. And they would tell me how Dick would call him every two weeks. And they still had a great relationship. And wow. you know, always wants to call and know what's going on. I mean, he is just such a unique individual that truly was, as a head coach is, should be, out for every single one of the players. That was the wow. most important thing, is each one of these guys individually trying to help them to achieve the best of what they can achieve. Um, and so I was very, very fortunate to be around a guy like that. And, you know, I think my greatest compliment for him is that, you know, when people ask me about my coaches, that's kind of the first guy that comes to mind, you know, and I've had some great coaches over the years, but it's the first guy that comes to mind. And when I go back and think about it, what you have to realize is you can count my, my year before we won the Super Bowl, but you know, I was third string guy, whatever, wasn't in that role. I, I only played one year for Dick for me. Like that year we won the season, he retired right after that Super Bowl. So in my mind, the first thing I think is, oh yeah, you know, Coach Vermeil is the coach I think about. Like we were together forever. We had this great relationship. And I, I have to actually sit back and go, my gosh, we were together for one year. That was the kind of impact that this man had on me in one year because of the person that he was more than the coach that he was. Um, and that to me is probably the greatest compliment that I can give. Don't don't bring up how little time you spent together because it might make him cry. So yes. we don't want to. <laughs> yes, that's yes. a good leader, though. Yeah, I mean that it, that's that's Very that's much. leadership right there. When when you care that much, that's that's just that's just gonna make it contagious for other players to want to be I, able to work hard. For I him. love that he cried so much. You're like like what happened? Did you just watch Schindler's List? He's like, now we cut the fifth string tight end. That's what happened. <laughs> right. uh, exactly. Exactly. Uh, well, uh, what about the bob and weave? Did you oh, ever do yeah. the bob and weave? Did you only ever did hop one, in? I only did it one time, Julian. So first of all, I'm way too slow. So, you know, we scored from a long ways away oftentimes. So Bob and Lee was usually over by the time I got to the end zone. Um, <laughs> but I, I did try to stay out of it. I, I kind of, you know, tried to let that be the other guy's thing, is that, you know, whoever scored, and then our offensive linemen love to run down there and try to jump in and be a part of that Bob and Wheat. He doesn't so, want to take the shine. That's a, that's a leader. Telling you, he's inspiring no, just, me right now. The guy just, fun. you just inspire me. It was fun to watch everybody, you know, just enjoy that moment. Like, I, you know, I got enough, you know, the spotlight for different things and for what I was doing that season. It was fun for me to watch those guys have their moment and those guys get together. But that actually came from the late, great Frank Gans, who was a great special teams coach in the league. He was unbelievable in terms of the way he motivated guys. You know, quarterbacks never go to special teams meeting. But whenever we didn't have our own meeting, we would find our way in there because he was so great with motivation. And so uh, the bob and weave came from uh, a video of Muhammad Ali that he was showing the guys, uh, trying to get them fired up for something that, you know, it was bob and weave and him always dancing around and moving. And somehow out of that is where we came with this bob and weave, which was, you know, kind of a boxing reference. Um, but that became, you know, our kind of symbol of what we were all about and bobbing and weaving and kind of like 
you know, Muhammad Ali, you know, we're kind of the pretty ones, you know, we're, we're the greatest show on turf. And it was kind of a fun little mantra for our guys because we kind of played very similar to the way Muhammad Ali boxed. Yeah, that's – I never knew that. I didn't know it came from Ali. I got a quick, quick question, and we got to settle something. You know, we, we had a little <laughs> interaction on social media recently about the gloves. And, uh, you know, I want to apologize, but I do want to let you know you were 1-0 <laughs> – in a Super Bowl where you didn't have a glove and then you lost a Super Bowl when you had the glove. So yeah. technically I'm not wrong on it. Uh, I mean, you, why'd you, you go have, to glove? You can have your preference. It's, it's actually a, it's a great question. A great story. Um, so you lose grip strength. I, well, when I was in St. Louis, I suffered uh, a number of hand injuries and yeah. There it is. A that happened to me in the Lakinta Inn recently. A lot of speculation on, you know, why I ended up not staying in, in St. Louis after that. But here's what happened, Julian, is that, you know, when I would be out there practicing and throwing the football, and, and even when I played after some of those hand injuries, I was completing 67, 68% of my passes. I was completing the balls that I expected myself to complete in practice, all of this stuff. But I remember reading an article that said, you know, and again, I'm sure it was more speculation than anything. There was no way to back up the facts, but basically saying, oh, the reason, you know, Kirk's not in St. Louis anymore was because he suffered these hand injuries and he doesn't have the same strength and can't control the football like he did before. And so part of me, like I think a lot of athletes want to do is we want to take that, you know, article and rip it up and throw it away. And it's like, that's a bunch of BS, like, they don't know what they're talking about. All they got to do is come out and see me throw, blah, blah, the blah. The other part, though, the other part but is the like, let me go part, try a glove. But the other part said, what if, what if there is a little bit of truth to this? You know, what could I possibly do, right? And, and I think, to me, that's what, you know, we all want to be as great players is like, I know what I can do, but is there something, Tony, your point earlier, is there something that's holding me back. Is there something that's possibly stopping me from being the best that I could be? Yeah. And so, so I, when I got to Arizona, I actually wasn't starting at the time, but I, I went like on a nine week quest, trying all the different gloves, like a, a sticky wide receiver gloves. Um, I ended up watching Ben Lothersberger play on a Monday night in cold weather. So Ben, in cold weather, every once in a while, I would throw a glove on. With the leather, the leather gloves. It was, yeah, the old leather gloves. And so I'm like, hmm. Never even thought about that. I didn't even know they made them at the time. So I went and got myself some leather gloves and went through the process, started to get comfortable with the gloves. And I'll never forget that Matt Leiter was playing. He got injured, uh, you know, second to last game of the year in, in 06. And, um, you know, so obviously I, I was going in. And I remember my quarterback coach coming over to me and going, hey, Coach Green wants to know, are you really going to play with those gloves? Because I had never <laughs> I had never played in a game with the gloves before. I had just been experimenting in practice. And I'm like, two games to go. We're not going anywhere. I mean, I've been trying this out. We got to give it a shot. So played in that game, played really well, played really well in the last game. And then I said, okay, this is a full-time thing now. So from then on, I got the gloves. I wore the gloves. And before you ask that question, Jewel, I'm just going to say, to this day, I have no idea if the gloves help me or not. Like, there's not one thing – there's not one thing I could point to to say, oh, yeah, when I put the gloves on, I threw the ball better than I did. I don't know. But Kurt. my whole point was it didn't hurt me, So, and I wanted to make sure that nothing held me back from being able to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. And so it all led back to that one article where someone was critical of me, of me going, hey, I got to challenge both sides. And, and, and that was in 2006. I was at Kent State 2006, 2007, 2008. And I was playing quarterback. I remember seeing him wear a glove. So I went and wore a glove. And the reason why I always said, I don't want to go with the quarterback who's wearing a glove, because then I was only doing it because I couldn't throw. I, I couldn't <laughs> grip the ball. I wasn't a good thrower. So I was trying to get anything, like he said, to get the best. You got a pretty high passer your, rating. High passer rating, but it's, it's different. But like, <laughs> so going back to the point of me not liking quarterbacks with gloves, because I was that quarterback that was already pre-snap thinking, hey, is this glove going to work? If I'm thinking about my glove, if I'm thinking about yeah. my grip, like how am I supposed to read a yeah. defense, get a play communicated, go out and like that should be the last thing I'm thinking about. <laughs> so like that, tell, I don't know. You know what I mean? So that's why I went on that. I just wanted to apologize. I didn't want to offend you. I was more, okay. It was more for just, other uh, guys. Well, Kurt, you, don't you put just, your mindset on me, Jules. 
I was never worried about whether I was going to be able to make it so. I, that I, never crossed my mind when I went up to them. So just because you had that mind, that was not my mindset ever. I know, but I've also thrown with thousands of quarterbacks, and anytime yeah. a guy comes on with the glove, I mean, I've done a little data analysis. Okay, a little let's data go. analysis. Bring it on, bring it on. I'm waiting. We're gonna go out. We gotta run some, some routes. I've been trading with some little, some young guys, and so I got to throw it every once in a while. Let's go. I'm ready. I'm, down. I, I'm ready. I've been training. Let's go. Kurt, you've been such a, you've been change such a your great... mindset on the double gloves and the yeah. quarterbacks that you want to play with. Well, dude, you've been such a great guest, Kurt. We really appreciate you uh, giving us your time. And, and this was such a fun game to revisit. Thank you so much for coming on. I you appreciate you, Kurt. Me. Thanks for having me. And I, and I really do mean when I say he's like just his story, the man he lives, like the guy he is with his family, his his on the field performance, his off the field performance, his just his ability to be a great man is is really truly inspirational. I'm a I think I hit man. you once. I I'm hit a, you up one night. I think yeah. I may have had like a cocktail. I mean, I saw a story about him. I was like, damn, I got I DM'd him like Kurt Warner, I just want to say you inspire me. Do you remember that? I do remember. Yeah, I do so, remember that. Yeah, I, <laughs> I love it. I love a shit face, Julian, it. just hitting you up. Like, <laughs> dude, was you're it, the best. Hey, it, it, it's cool. At the end of the day, right? I mean, we can have our great performances in Super Bowls, but I think at the end of the day, we realize those come and go and players come that are better than us. You can leave some kind of impact and impression on the people around you. Then that's when you really wanted the game alive. So, so I appreciate moments like that. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kurt. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. Appreciate you. Thanks, bro. Guys. Thank you for coming on. How crazy was the year before Tom Brady gets his opportunity by the starting quarterback getting knocked out. The same exact thing happens for Kurt Warner. Yeah. With green Matt. Gr what is his name? Trent Green. Trent Green. Yeah, that's got to hurt that you don't remember his name. Like, that's like you're not forgetting Kurt Warner's name. Uh, yeah, and, that, and that's, a, that's a my bad because Trent Green does a lot of our games. We've had production meetings. He was a really good football player. but Terrific quarterback. But he's not Kurt with, Warner. We, well, yeah, cause, but he could have been. Could have. A lot of it's opportunity, right? Could have, should have, would have. <laughs> Coulda, shoulda, woulda. There's an old saying. If I my... hope your coworker doesn't hear that. That's painful. Right I know. There. It's but it's. I mean, that's yeah. the real, the realistic. Yeah. You know, Kurt Warner goes on, gets MVP of yeah. the season, mm -hmm. MVP of the Super Bowl. Yeah. And then is is part of one of the most legendary offenses of all time, which he does believe he could dominate. Did he say dominate in this this year? Yeah, this league, I, I agree. Don't this you? league now. 2022 that, that offense don't you think they could still dominate they'd be pretty good they were built for it they were they were a spread them and shred them let's get five wide let's get marshall falk on a insane matchup against a a linebacker and let him do his work the linebackers would cover a little better now though yeah true you know the, the, the league has changed the you know, back in those days but they changed because of a team like this because of this team yeah and honestly it's really because of the 49ers that's what happened back in 85 when they threw out the bear defense is an old 46 yeah. and, and the, the Niners came out and they were the team that were spreading the ball out. They were, they were getting two, three yard passes and getting catch and run plays, which, you know, that's where it really started. They moved on and, and developed it into their, their little, uh, shtick of, the, of their, of their day. Shtick. Shtick. That's, I've never heard anyone describe football as shtick. This is how you know you get two Jews running a podcast <laughs> here. <laughs> what, what shtick are you planning for the next play? The offensive shtick. <laughs> I think uh, it, it learned a lot from Kurt Warner. For one thing, he did not care for my masturbation humor. Uh, no, that he, did not go over well. He's a God guy. He's a God guy. He's a God guy. He's a God guy. I eh? really... Not, that doesn't land with the ball. I really blew it there. That was uh, <laughs> a, I really, I really bombed for a legend. Uh, no, he's a, he's a. He wasn't he, a professional though. You see how he, he didn't really show you no. that that like he didn't like it, but he he kind of you saw it in I his eye, it. and then he kept it. Yeah. He kept it moving. He didn't. He didn't acknowledge he it, didn't which, acknowledge hurt, it. which almost hurt more than disgust. Or you're just like, oh, you're nothing to me. I'm like, all right. But uh, no, he's incredible. He, he, he was fascinating. We learned uh, for the over-under, for the prop bet, Dick, Dick Vermeil crying. It was supposed to be 3.5. It sounds like it was more than 3.5, but we didn't get a number. Can we go to the books? What do you think? We're going to count it as a win. As a win. Now, if this, was a, if this was in Vegas right now and I was running a casino, I would say that's fucking bullshit. 
Really? You, yeah, you didn't give no number. Mm. I, I would maybe, I'd maybe issue a push. A push. He said countless. Countless, I believe. Was it the sounds like the number was huge, is yeah. what I'm guessing. Because he, he, he cried about a guy, a fifth tight end getting cut. So that's got to be like, if you're crying about that. What a man with a heart. Uh, it may be. Maybe he's just a bitch. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. He's, he's clearly a good man. I'm just, I remember, he's a wonderful man. <laughs> isn't he the one who gave Vince Papali his opportunity with the Philadelphia Eagles? I believe that's right. Let you know how just, LT used that. to send hookers to the opposing team? Maybe maybe the opposing team would send Dick Vermeil a copy of like Marley and me or something. <laughs> to like just break him. Just break him before the game. <laughs> oh, we got Jackie. Jules, I got a quick six degrees of separation stat check here. Dick Vermeil, 1963, on the coaching staff at the College of San Mateo. CSM, Bulldog, baby. Wow. He's They do have a picture of old Dick Vermeil in the Bulldog locker room framed right next to old John Madden, wow. right next to Bill Ring. A lot of great people came out of College of San Mateo. Shout out, Matteo, once a bulldog, always a bulldog. Wow. Uh, is the greatest show on turf the best nickname for this offense? I mean, that's that's probably the greatest nickname for an offense. Yeah. That's pretty tight. Back in those days when you had a team that played on like AstroTurf, the game's almost, it's a faster game. Yeah. And and that's what that offense was. You just saw speed, guys running across the field, crossers, catching runs, these old like Jerry Rice type plays because they did have that uh, West Coast offense, which was, you know, what, what Bill Walsh came out and, and started uh, back in Cincinnati. So it should technically be called the Midwest offense. Mm. How, how about like Marshall Falk now? Because he's like, is, would he be like a Debo Samuel type of guy now? Or, or what do you think? He runs like better routes than... 30% of the league at receivers run. Yeah. So, I mean, he he's he was a matchup problem. And he'd definitely have, he'd be one of those guys that you designed to get the ball to, give him out. Like, I mean, that's what they did, though. Screen yeah. game, draw game, you know, little ram routes across the middle on a linebacker, little option routes on the outside to, you know, uh, against the linebacker, seam routes. And, and we used to do a lot of those types of throws in New England with our third down running backs, you know, started with Kevin Falk, went to uh, Danny Woodhead, shout out who might, pl I think he's, he might qualify for the U S open. I think he's close. Let me check in on Danny here. But uh, another really good, like route running, uh, running back Shane Vereen. Mm -hmm. And now James white, which we saw earlier in one of the yeah. episodes, you know, these guys that are just match up problems because they can run routes, but also you can give them the ball in between the tackles. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> who would play who would play you in a movie, Julian? Because we had uh Kurt Warner had the Shazam dude. Who who's playing Julian Edelman? I would want Denzel Washington to play me. <laughs> Are we talking like Malcolm X Denzel or like Macbeth? Training Day? Training Day. Training okay. Day. Training Day. <laughs> All right. He had to be crooked to took it. What 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 lyric was that? I forgot. You remember what what the song? Remember. I forgot. What it was song old. is that? Let me check in on that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> is that your favorite Denzel movie? I love John Q. Never saw it. It makes you, if you, you send that to Dick for me, it'll make him cry. I tell you that right now. It's when, Damn. you know, he's got the sick son, he's got cancer, and, and it puts him in a desperate situation where he has to rob the hospital to even to get his son, you know, some treatment. Oh, wow. And so he like, ha like, ho like holds a stand up and hostages and. I don't know. I, that one really touched me. I, I love all of Denzel. Denzel's movies. one of the best. Who's playing me? I don't know. That's Who's playing you? I have no idea. Hmm. Adam Carolla? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> who would play you? Yeah, we're going to have to get back to who would play you. I, I would just cast you. You Really? Yeah, you okay. act. No. You're in the Joker. Eh. You were the one who made eh. the Joker become crazy. Everyone says that. You're the stand-up oh. comedian that put the Joker into an insane mindset. Hey, you know, Joaquin won the Oscar. Could have been me who was nominated. You never know. Best supporting uh, actor. Yeah. We have been, we have an Oscar nominated in our hearts supporting actor <laughs> on our squad right now. That's how my agent's gonna push me for gigs. In our hearts, he was nominated. Like, we don't know what that means. No one knows what that uh, what else? So Warner and That's then, definitely then, that was a pretty that's a that's a Cinderella story. Oh yeah. It's crazy. I mean, this is this is a miracle team type of thing. I mean, this is no one that saw it coming. He's on the bench. Like it, it's cool to see a quarterback become a star like that and we saw it back to back years as we said with warner and then brady bagging groceries to hoisting 
one Lombardi. Pretty crazy. I yeah. watched that movie. I, that's why I, I, we had all the questions about that. I, I was flying and I, I watched the movie R and D for this this interview, and it was awesome. Jack, awesome. Do, do we forget anything here? One clarification: it is Boston Common, not Boston Commons. Jeez, who I'm said a, that? I'm a yeah, I'm a Boston guy. You said that? Yeah. Damn. Yeah, but don't you call about, it the Commons? I think Common. Well, I mean, what, what, what have I been saying? My so favorite, my favorite rapper no one... is uh, Common Sense. <laughs> how come? I, I, I swear I've said that to people in Boston. They're like, yeah, I'll meet you over there. Where? The garden area? What, what's the other side? The duck pond? We got the duck pond? You got the duck pond. You got the public garden. Public garden. Be skating through there all the time. <laughs> all my little coming. electric board. <laughs> oh, we got a stat check on Denzel there. That was, the line is from the movie, but then... It was also referenced in Jada Kiss's 2000. That's song. what it was. Jada Kiss. 2004. Why? In the song, right, also yeah. Jada Kiss was good. I like Jada. We used to listen. To, so I was a California kid. So I'll, and from the Bay Area, growing up, we would listen to like the hyphy music, like Mac Dre, Mac Maw, uh, E Forty, Andre Nicotina. And so when I went over to Kent State in Ohio, full full California kid. And then there's a kind of a cult following of our music over in that area. I, I, I linked up with a guy, a bunch of guys from like Maryland, Virginia, and they introduced me to Jada Kiss. And, and like, it was, you probably listened to him, right? Love Jada. Yeah. New York guy. Right. I mean, he was, he was killer. Uh, I remember he and, uh, he and 50 had beef, right? Remember that? Yeah. That was, I mean, I remember all that. Great, great. I mean, I enjoyed them both. What was his sound? It was like, it was something like that. <laughs> that was pretty good. <coughs> well, it was something like Julian's that. Julian's got crazy range in so many ways. That was that was impressive. I I, I, I remember that he would. Is that the, is that the sound jack? I believe so. I was a little more partial to Pusha T's. Yeah, <laughs> but still a good one. <laughs> okay, everyone had a saying back in that day. Yeah, I can't. Do little it. John. Yeah. What else do we have, Jack? I gotta. I'll run through a quick little list here. London Fletcher. 256 career starts, one of only five players to never miss a game. That's never. insane for a linebacker. Linebacker. Yeah. How many Pro Bowls do you have? I think he only had one. To be a guy that has to plug up the hole, and he wasn't like a big guy. He was he was like a smaller linebacker, came from a small school. There's just like big bodies around. You could like it's not even the fact that you're contacting all the time. There's like ankles that come up when you get rolled up on or your knee or when you're pushing the pile guy hits you or you know there's like so many variables that are just going on the field to not get hurt yeah i mean that's 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 all that's honestly that's like kissed by god london yeah. made four pro bowls four i mean he's was a way john off. carroll guy john carroll mm. four pro bowls is is impressive john carroll Shout out. We had like half of our staff was from John Carroll. I believe Daniel uh, McDaniels is there. Josh McDaniels, mm. Dave Ziegler, Jerry. He always gets mad when I don't put him in that that group. Ohio school. Yeah. D, D2. D3. That must be crazy rare to. I mean, that's insane. It's very. There's there's very few guys that come out of, you know, division two, three. There's they got that. I think Mount Union's over there, which is a huge divi like division two team in Ohio. But that that's a big like coach school. A lot of coaches come from that school, so London Fletcher must have had some of those smarts to stay healthy, Damn. avoid that stuff. All right, I'll hit these real quick. We talked about the Guardians uh, in Cleveland. They're named after the Guardians of Traffic, which are yeah. monolithic Art Deco sculptures. Um, They're on, on the, the, the bridge. Memorial bridge. Yep. We also they know their fan base real well. <laughs> Like, oh, good Art Deco! This is what we want to scream for, piss drunk in the afternoon, <laughs> dude. How about how about Major League? <laughs> great With, movie. How great were those movies? Would they would be like wild thing? The guy in the, the 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 stands hitting the the drum. They'd have bags on their head. I want let's do let's get Charlie Sheen on here and do Major League. That's a that's a game with names. Or you can get Willie Mays Hayes. Ooh, remember love da Willie Danny Mays. gave a reference to that in our in interview with all the gloves. Uh, I'll give a little shine to the Rams defense that year. They were fourth in the NFL in points allowed, first in run defense, and tied for the lead league with 57 sacks. Uh, we also mentioned Drew Bledsoe. He signed the biggest contract in NFL history that year, mm. 10 years, 103, 103 million guaranteed. Wow. And, um, first $100 million contract gets hurt. The rest is history. Tom Brady's going for number eight in 2023. And then I got a quick update on uh, our man Danny Woodhead. 
He uh, advanced in the local qualifier in Omaha, so he's one step away from qualifying for the U.S. Open, which will be held at the Country Club in Brookline. Brookline, Mass. There's an yeah. old story that uh, they wouldn't let Brady in. What? Said he was too popular. They don't want that, that that distraction. I heard he had to get in through his wife. He didn't tell me that. I never asked him that. That's what I heard. They though. wouldn't let Tom Brady in because he was too popular? Yeah, you know the country club people. What a backhanded. That's like a woman being like, I'm not going to fuck you. Your dick is too big. I'm not doing it. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it's Tom Brady. He's a legend. Yeah. it's He's it's a not, Boston legend. I think he got in, but he may have been wait, like waitlist. I don't know. Who waitlist Tom Brady in Massachusetts? That's crazy. That's what I've heard. Did you guys hear that story or am I completely wrong? I remember it, yeah. That's crazy. The Brookline Country Club. Well, shout out to Danny Woodhood who texted me earlier this week asking for Tom Brady to sponsor him with Brady Brand. And I said, hey, we'll give you some JE11, dude. What's going on? But then I'll, I'll forward your, your message to Tom too. Uh, probably a good thing I didn't get many chicks my freshman year of college because I had a Danny Woodhead fathead on the wall of my dorm room. <laughs> <laughs> That's when fatheads became huge. <laughs> your Woodhead uh, prevented you from getting Woodhead. <laughs> I, I'll blame it on that. <laughs> Last, we got two stat corrections. Kurt was technically a second-year QB that year, as was Tom Brady uh, when he made the Super Bowl and played against Kurt. But they they both they didn't play though. Right? They, yeah, they didn't play. This is their first time. Right. So technicalities here. So name the game. Is it the longest yard? The reach game? The greatest show on turf? The tackle? I mean, to me, it's the longest yard because the greatest show on turf. That's the team. Team. Yeah. Yeah, it's got to be the longest yard because. Uh, Burt Reynolds, the longest yard back in the 60s. They redid it with Adam Sandler. And Rock. And Rock. Yeah. That was fun, fun Did remake. you see that picture of Eli and Peyton next to the Rock, how tall those dudes are? No. They dwarfed them. Really? Yeah, dude. It's crazy. It's re they're, they're really tall dudes. Yeah. People don't realize they're like a, a, a tall 6'5". Wow. Yeah, I mean, Peyton seemed tall. Eli, for whatever reason, it... it he just it, wears it. He wears yeah. it, you know, sneakily. He's sneakily tall. Sneaky six five, it's nuts. I mean that. I mean that helps you be a great quarterback. You could see over people, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, there's guys that do it shorter. I, I was a. I was always a small quarterback. I didn't yeah. always think that, but it. It's true. It's definitely true. You. You can <laughs> see. It's. You see a lot more. Let's score this bad boy. We got to score. score. What are we doing? So, so stakes. It's the Super Bowl. You got to go high. Right. It's got to high. It's got to be high. What are you saying? Nine five nine it's the Super Bowl. It's got to be like a 9-5 because it wasn't like a back-to-back -back Super Bowl. There was like, you know what I mean? Like we, And they went back the next yes, year. they the went Rams, back the next so. year. Now, that one, the stakes would have been, if they won it, probably higher than this one. So we got to go, what, 9-5? We'll go 9-5. Star power is pretty damn big. I mean, we're looking at, uh, you know, McNair, a recognizable name, Eddie George, Marshall Falk, Kurt Warner. We, we've named all the names. Isaac I think, Bruce. I think, was Eddie George on the cover of Madden? This year? He might have been. It's either this year or the year before. Eddie Eddie George was a monster. I loved the Tennessee Titans because of Eddie George. Yeah. He was I, one of I would play he with him a bunch of like, what was this, Madden 2000? He was on Madden 01. So what was it? This was, so it was after this year's. Yeah. But the, youth, the big the big running backs of this era, I remember being like Falk, Eddie George, Edrin James. Edrin like, James. There were some badass running backs. Well, yeah, the running back probably Sean had, Alexander. Sean Alexander. The running back was was more relevant then. The towards the end of the ground and pound type thing. You had Bettis. Remember Jerome Bettis? The bus. You had Garrison Hurst and you had yes. early Frank Gore. It's coming back. Well, it does that's pendulums. It's coming back. Because once you start getting these Saquon. Small, yeah. Could it's be. Coming, it's gotta come back. Come on. You we know. drafted a running back very high. Please come back. Well, it has to. I mean, that's why you see the Patriots. They are always running the ball because linebackers are, are so much smaller now. Yeah. You know, it's harder to plug up. Those. They're built for speed. These guys are fast. For sure. So, you know, it's it's a matchup thing. How you, How's your team going to match up? That's why all these coaches are so obsessed with running the football, running the football, running the football. Star power. Where are you going? Like nine? It's, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a nine. It's a nine. It's a nine. Gameplay. You know, the first first half was... Like Kurt said, they just couldn't get it in the red area. They couldn't yeah. score. But then that fourth quarter does, you got to give it props. Lights out. Yeah. So that, I think the McNair fourth, play, unreal. McNair and Eddie George in the second half. Are Eddie amazing. George. But also Kurt Warner, Isaac Bruce linking up on that, giving them a lot of time. You remember that was uh, gameplay? I'd say we have to go 
a nine. Yeah, nine is fair. It was so like the last play. At the last you're at the edge of your seat. Did it he ma- score? It made it here for a reason. It's just not. It's not just the names. It's a crazy Super Bowl. And then the name. It's tough because the longest yard. You mentioned the movie, so that does that does hurt the name a little. Kind of hurts it. But isn't that what you think of when you think of the longest yard? But you don't think of this like the greatest show on turf. It's an unbelievable nickname, but it's not the game. It's not the game. I'm going like eight for the name. Yeah, we'll go eight. What's that give us an average of? This is still a high ass total. Eight point eight seven five. That's a high score. Eight point eight. Yeah, that's like a B B plus. Depends on who set the curve. High B plus. We could round up to eight point nine here, right? I mean, well, this was a class. This is a classic game. Kurt Warner was a great guest. Uh, that's all for this episode of Games with Names, presented by WinBet. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to our sponsors. Follow us on social media at Games with Names. I'm Sam Morell. And I'm Julian Edelman. And we'll see you next time, folks.